This FedGov Today program is sponsored by Cohesity. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, the must-have list for solid cyber resilience. Step one, you have to be able to guarantee, almost, that at least your backups will survive Mm -hmm. because they're going to be the root of everything that you do from that point forward. Marlon McFate of Cohesity on FedGov Today in just a moment. A task force that would bring together all the parts of the federal government that defend against nation state attacks is part of a bill in Congress called the Strengthening Cyber Resilience Against State-Sponsored Threats Act. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency would lead the task force. Attacks like Volt Typhoon and others have focused attention on cyber resilience at agencies. At the Billington Cybersecurity Summit recently, Marlon McFate, Public Sector Chief Technology Officer and Chief Information Security Officer at Cohesity, tells me the definition of cyber resilience is evolving. We've always been concerned within organizations about how do I recover the operations, uh, you know, the the, uh, the the critical systems within my organization, the ability to do uh, the mission, uh, my data in and of itself, those types of things. But the threat landscape and what we're dealing with had certainly changed, and it continually changes, uh, you know, over over the course of time. Right? I'm not going to say that it started in 2015. I mean, things changed in the 15, 16. Uh, realm, uh, but a lot of organizations are still stuck thinking of resiliency as data resiliency. And I like to make a distinction between data resiliency and cyber resiliency. Data resiliency gets you, it's the things we've been practicing for you know, decades. You know, how do I survive something that you know, either destroys uh, a portion of my data or disrupts me from accessing my data. These are typically natural disasters, uh, fires, some unforeseen act of God, if you will. Whereas uh, cyber resiliency is, you know, a little bit different, right? In the cybersecurity world, we're probably one of the only people within IT uh, that, uh, uh, you know, one, we're tra- always trying to prove a negative. We're, we're scared of something happening that hasn't necessarily happened yet. Uh, and second is, is we have adversaries that are trying to harm our organizations, actively trying to harm uh, or work, uh, you know, against us. And so when it becomes a cyber incident, uh, there's this added area of loss of trust, right? And just going back to the word resiliency, if you take a look at the definition in uh, the Webster Dictionary under material science, I think that's a really good analogy. It's how far a material can bend and then be able to return to its original shape uh, without breaking, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, And there's varying degrees of that. Within cyber resiliency, we have to be able to survive a, or or, or our intention is to be able to quickly recover to a trusted state with as little, if any, data loss or loss within, you know, an operational scope within our systems. And that's a very difficult thing to do, right? Uh, if we're only thinking about data resiliency and not cyber resiliency, we're going to, uh, what I see organizations do a lot of times is this kind of death spiral of, you know, going back to, you know, prior to the incident, restoring from that. And basically it's really just setting back the, the clock, if you will, Mm -hmm. to the point where, uh, they're just reinfected, right? They're not actually going through, how do I regain trust in these systems? How do I regain trust in my data? And going through the proper clean room uh, mitigation steps, bringing in the cybersecurity team, figuring out how the adversary got into their system. Was it known vulnerabilities? How did they elevate their privileges? How did they uh, uh, retain persistence within their systems? And if you don't do those things, you're just going to continually go through this cycle of reinfection. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then also, you're not stopping yourself. Even if you are lucky enough to survive after that, you're not stopping uh, another group or maybe even that same group from in the future coming back and doing the exact same thing Mm -hmm. uh, to you again. Yeah. Yeah. How does that evolving understanding then of the concept of resilience inform the way that organizations and government should think about their cyber defenses and should think about the steps they need to do to continue to maintain their their secure postures, oh, those that have them. Absolutely, and actually, uh, you bring up a really good point. So, if you take a look at uh, pretty much any framework out there, one of the statistics that I that I see every single year 
um, uh, that comes out is the disparity in how much we spend protecting our environments. You know, like if you just take a look at NIST, right? We have, um, uh, you know, protect is on the left hand side, recovers on the right hand side. So the protect and detect, we spend, I think at the last number I saw was a north of 80% of our budgets on that side, mm. right? We're, we're lulled into the sense that if I just do a really good job at protecting my environments, I may never have to actually do a respond and recover mm -hmm. to one of these types of incidences where, but if you take a look at the news, I mean, that kind of leads you to believe that that's not necessarily the case, yeah. right? Uh, and that if you take a look at the news, it also kind of shows that uh, we're not necessarily doing a great job, right? So one is, is we're spending the bulk of our time there. And I think organizations, especially the ones I talk to, because you bring up the word cyber resiliency, and eyes light up. They're like, yes, you know, this mm -hmm. is something I need to understand better. This is something I need to do better. So they're starting to realize that, uh, you know, with the statistics right now, and I hate to use the, the adage, you know, it's not if, but when, yeah. right? I hate that. But, you know, it is to a certain degree that is pretty true, right? So that they need to prepare for those. And so we've actually set out a cyber resiliency model, which aligns to other resiliency model. So it's really just how do you achieve that though, right? And a res resiliency model can say, here's a framework, but how do you actually achieve that? What are the necessary capabilities? And what we've found is in step one, you have to be able to guarantee almost that at least your backups will survive mm -hmm. because they're going to be the root of everything that you do from that point forward, whether that be investigation, mitigation, forensics, right? What do you need to do that? You have to have a recovery environment, right? So there's a lot of preparation that goes in place for that. So, you know, how, where am I going to build that? What is that going to look like? That environment has to have the minimum viable response capability. So it has to have good trusted tooling. I have to figure out a way to bring up authentication or, or Active Directory again, because that's more than likely going to be uh, a toast. If you take a look at the statistics uh, right now, I think it's something like 89% uh, of Active Directory in these incidences are compromised. You can't trust that anymore, right? That was actually the method of probably elevating privileges within the environment, right? So how do I get an environment that I can just start with to start doing my investigation, forensics, uh, cleaning, mitigation, so that I can then promote quickly back into uh, production and get my services back online as quickly as possible, as little disruption and as little, if any, data loss. We have about a minute left. Speaking of data, um, we talked before we uh, went on the air about uh, the importance of agencies using data and gaining data, gaining insights uh, from their data. How's that porting to what organizations are trying to do with AI? Well, it, really interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, we, uh, if we only have a minute, uh, because I could talk about this one forever. Um, one of the reasons why I came to Cohesity was very unique, especially in the secondary data market, is typically uh, secondary data, backup recovery, anyone doing that kind of foundational work takes the data and locks it away, right? And the one thing that Cohesity does that's very different is we actually index everything that comes in because as you said, structure and unstructured. Structure's easier to work with because by definition, it has some sort of structure mm -hmm. to it. Unstructured on the other hand, uh, which is the bulk of our data and probably where the most interesting information might lie, right, is not structured. So how do I do that? And so we developed something called Gaia, um, which really wanted to answer a couple of questions. One, how can I have a conversation with my data? Everyone wants to use generative AI, which is a good a tool. Unfortunately, it's a creative tool, right? As opposed to an accurate tool. We've all heard about hallucinations mm -hmm. and those different issues, right? But so how do I use that on my data? But then there becomes questions like, well, I don't want to give my data to somebody else. Uh, you know, what about poisoning of the data? What about this? What about that? So there's a lot of concerns there. What we allow organizations to do, especially in the government, whether that be on a SaaS model or in a completely on-premise model, allow them to utilize their unstructured data with the generative AI through retrieval augmented generation, so they can now start having a conversation with it. And not only is that good for e-discovery and for investigations, analysis, research, uh, law enforcement's using it, compliance uh, 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 use cases, but it's also really good to just see what's in the data 
and to start to organize, curate, collate that data so that I can now utilize maybe that for something else, whether that be uh, data graphing or machine learning uh, you know, activity. So it becomes a good way to find the structure to place on the unstructured data. Marlon McFade of Cohesity. You can read more about resilience on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. The FedGov Today podcast is back tomorrow. To make sure you don't miss it, follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. And you can listen on demand at fedgovtoday.com. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks very much for listening.